the pieces of our program that we've had to suspend for quite some while. And so uh, in August the 25th, our Wednesday night suppers begin again. The second Sunday in September, we're relaunching uh, our Sunday school program. The first Sunday, we will have our classes, but that's Labor Day, and so we know just about, well, many people will be gone. So it's hard to kind of give a big emphasis and maybe a high attendance number, and we know everybody's going to be gone. But. So it's the second Sunday. Our classes will be starting back up again, and we'll be sharing more information, and there will be probably some movement of people. Cause we're coming out of this weird time where we've been in here or in there, and so anyway, be patient with us as those changes sort of come, and uh, be expectant, be expectant that, be expectant that we're not going back to the past. We're moving into God's future. So keep that in mind, too, uh, as we do these exciting things. So here's the way we're going to pray tonight. I, I'm going to call your attention to the nursing home residents and the homebound because we will never, ever forget these people. I know that many of you stay in touch with them. You call them. You send them cards. Thank you for doing that. We're praying for them tonight. And we'll shift our attention to the middle column and the special prayer needs, and I'll ask you just to pray around those people there. And then our church families, we've been praying through this group for quite some while. And finally, we always kind of think about that international mission, or we announce it, but we rarely make that a prayer focus. Mauritius is an island nation about a thousand miles east of India, out in the Indian Ocean. And uh, we have missionaries that are there. It's a French-influenced um, country. Um, so anyway, I'll call your attention to that, and then I'll close our prayer time. So we will start with our nursing home residents there. So if you would, that the, our prayer guide pray through these names, especially those that you know who have special needs among these people. would shift your attention to the middle column and these that we have special prayer needs especially those that you can offer up to God the specific needs that these people have would you pray for them please Would you shift your attention to our church families and pray down through that list of names? Side is this international mission, Mauritius. I know you don't know the missionaries there or all of their needs, but God does. Would you pray for them?
Father and our God, how grateful we are that you welcome us into your throne room this night and every time we bow before you in prayer. We are certainly not worthy to have entree to the King of Kings, to the Lord of Lords, to him who is robed in majesty. So we come before you in deep humility, Lord, knowing that only because of Jesus and his life that was given for us and the fact that you have led us into faith in you only because of that can we come to you and say all of these things. And yet your word tells us that you bid us come, that you long for us to come, to come to you and to tell you all that's on our heart pour out our souls to you. So Lord God, we have prayed tonight. We've prayed for nursing home residents and homebound. We've prayed for people with special prayer needs. We've prayed for our church family and for a country far away. Lord, we know you've heard our prayers and we know that you will work your will in all of these and we submit to that. But also, Lord, as we have prayed for these, on our hearts there are burdens and fears and concerns and worries. So many things that are on us that we haven't talked about and we haven't listed on these papers. And yet they, they are the weights of our heart. Lord, we want to take these, our families, our children, our own health, our financial conditions, our dreams, our futures. We, we want to bring to you our past because we need that to be forgiven and redeemed so often. But all of this we wrap up, Lord, into a basket of, of gift. <laughs> and we give it to you and ask you to work in our lives. Work for strength, work for healing, work for restoration. Lord, work in our lives to help us to know your will and then work in our lives to give us the steadfast determination that we will obey your will and we will do as you call us. As a church people, Lord, may we have a new vision and a new energy and a new thrill to be your children and to work and to serve you. Lord God, you have worked through this church in so many ways for a hundred and... 70 years, a, a long time that you have worked through us. But Lord, we really do believe that you're ready and wanting to do a new work through us. A work that sees our community and wants them to know Christ and gives ourselves in, in eager, give eager energy, Lord, towards seeing our community know Jesus and grow in Him and many of them to be a part of this fellowship where we can work and worship together. Lord, we can't see very far down the road, but we know that You see the end from the beginning. So You know what's next and You know how we are to go and how we are to live and what we are to do. So guide us guide us in all of this there has never been Lord such a joy such a sense of adventure there has never been one outside of being your child and living this great adventure of being a Christian. Thank you for it. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Brother Woody. The Bible <clears throat> says of the first disciples that they gave up everything and followed him. I, I don't know that he's asking us to give up everything maybe to give him everything. But as the song says, we will follow the steps of Jesus where'er they go.
And that's the hymn we're singing, Footsteps of Jesus. Let's sing. Sweetly, Lord, have we heard the calling, come follow me. And we see when it's falling, lead us to thee. Footprints of Jesus that make the Bible to 2 Kings chapter 20. We are dealing with this prayer of Hezekiah. It's the second prayer that we've seen of his. The first one we saw quite some while ago, but this is the second one. And we actually got to the prayer last week, but there's some substance after the prayer that I think we need to deal with, and so that's what we're working with now. Uh, chapter 20, the prayer is actually at verse 3, so that's where I'm going to start tonight. I'm going to read from 3 down through 11, and we will, we will see how much we can do. Here's the prayer. It's just one verse. Remember now, O Lord, I beseech you how I have walked before you in truth and with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Before Isaiah had gone out of the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him saying, Return and say to Hezekiah, the leader of my people, Thus saith the Lord, the God of your father David, I have heard your prayer, I have seen your tears. Behold, I will heal you. On the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord. I will add 15 years to your life, and I will deliver you in this city from the hand of the king of Assyria, 
and I will defend this city for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Then Isaiah said, Take a cake of figs. That's a poultice of figs. And they took it and they laid it on the boil and he recovered. So now Hezekiah said to Isaiah, What will be the sign that the Lord will heal me and that I shall go up to the house of the Lord the third day? And Isaiah said, This shall be the sign to you from the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing that he has spoken. So shall the shadow go forward ten steps or go back ten steps? And Hezekiah answered, It's easy for the shadow to decline or to go forward ten steps. No, but let the shadow turn backward ten steps. So Isaiah the prophet cried to the Lord, and he brought the shadow on the stairway back ten steps on which it had gone down on the stairway of Ahaz. So last week I dealt with some of the underbrush on this thing and don't need to go back and do that in much detail. Uh, I would just point out one thing, which is the, version, the English version that I read had in verse 11, the stairway, and many of you have something like dial or sundial or degrees. And so those are all uh, legitimate ways to translate the Hebrew text that lies behind this. When it was translated by the Septuagint translators, they put in the word clearly that was step. So that was the way they interpreted that 200 years before Jesus. And almost all modern English translations today do the word step. Whether it was a sundial or it was a step, and like I say, both of those are legitimate translations of the Hebrew that's behind it, the miracle is exactly the same. The miracle that is happening is something phenomenal in, in astronomy is, is taking place that clearly indicated to Ezekiel, uh, to Hezekiah that God was going to do exactly what God had said. And we'll get back to part of that in just a moment. So where we left it last week, we had seen the prayer and we were started to kind of unpack the prayer of, of what Hezekiah had said, that he wept bitterly, he turned to the wall, and, and then he, God hears his prayer, God speaks to Isaiah. Isaiah has brought the message from God, you're going to die, get your house in order. He doesn't say when, he just says this is going to happen, and then after he's delivered the message, Isaiah turns around and starts leaving the king's house, but he hasn't even gotten all the way out of the house before the Lord speaks to him. The Lord's answer is much longer than Hezekiah's prayer, tells him to go back and deliver this new word to Hezekiah. So the new word is kind of what we were dealing with when we left it last Wednesday. The, the new word that the Lord is sending back to Hezekiah is, thus saith, verse 5, thus saith the Lord, so this the covenant name for God, Yahweh or Jehovah, either one, it is a proper pronunciation. Thus saith the Lord, the God of your father David, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will heal you. On the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord. Here's more of the response from God. I will add 15 years to your life, and I will deliver you in this city from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. So that's God's response. Almost the last thing I said to you last Wednesday was, there is no doubt that Hezekiah is ill. He, he has a mortal illness. He is going to die. The only thing we know about it is that something had manifest, manifested itself in something like a boil or a, an ulcerated wound on, on his body. Um, but it indicated a deeper illness, probably a systemic infection or something of that sort. He was gravely ill. The word from God was he was going to die. And this was not, as far as we know, God testing him, to, what will you do now? Oh, I was going to heal you all along. We can't deal so much with the, inner, with, with the inner deliberations of God. This is the text that we have. He came to him, you are going to die. He prays, he pours himself out before God, he weeps before God. I, I'm not going to tell you that every time you pour yourself out to God and weep before God that he's going to give you what you ask for. This is clearly falling within the will of what God 
God's intent long term for Hezekiah was. But here's where I'm going. God promised him healing. This is miraculous healing, if you want to call it that, which I do. This is God's intervention into the process. But it didn't happen like many healings happened, especially in the New Testament where someone is sick and Jesus said, you will be well, and bang, he's well. He's sick, and three days later, he's going to be well enough to get himself to the temple. It's going to take a long period of time. The miraculous healing of God that is coming into the life of Hezekiah is taking about three days to transpire. Well, was that miraculous? Or what? It, he was going to die, and God says, okay, you're going to live. So this is God's intervention into the process, but it doesn't happen immediately. And on top of all of that, how did, what was at least a, a physical evidence of the process of the healing was? A cake of figs. Take two of these and call me in the morning. Oh, just put some figs on top of that thing. It's like your mom did when you were a kid and just rub some, some witch hazel or some mentholatum or some absorbing junior or something, you know. And then you, you, it, it'll get you. It'll take care of you. Well, we do actually know that there are a lot of kind of like home remedy type things that are not, that are not quackery that people have discovered can bring about a healing sort of response. I don't know, maybe if you take a cake of figs and put it on a boil, it'll draw that infection out. I, I don't know. This was the medical procedures of their day. It wasn't a surgical procedure in the giving of some kind of, of antibiotic. This was the medical procedure. Nobody would have said, a cake of figs? What are you thinking? I mean, they would have thought, oh, well, why didn't we think of that? Or we knew he was going to die. We weren't going to give him the, the fig thing because he was going to die anyway. The, the figs was not a surprise. They would have thought, well, yeah, okay. Cake of figs, a poultice there. We'll slap that on that thing and some healing will come. They would have thought that the figs, they would have all thought God's intervention here. They would have all thought that but they would have known that this was a medical procedure used in their day that they put on the wound, and then the healing comes about. So where am I going with this? It's something that I've touched on before, but I, I did it during the COVID time, and a, a lot of us weren't able to maybe be a part of that. So I want to run this by you again. And here's kind of the way it goes. It's a bit, it's, it's a bit lengthy, I suppose, but here's my thinking on the matter. It is my conviction that all healing is from God. I don't think that there's healing that comes about as a medical process and there's healing that comes about as an intervention of God. And so if the healing by the medical process doesn't work, well, why don't you ask God and maybe He'll intervene and do something? Oh, well, that one didn't work. Maybe this one will. And if that one doesn't work, well, you'll go to Mexico and try some new medicine down there or whatever. No, it is my conviction that all healing that ever happens anytime in the history of the world, any place, is healing from God. And the reason I come to that conclusion is because the Scripture tells us that as a result of sin, death has come into the world. And so uh, death reigns in, in our world. God said to Adam and to Eve, when you eat of this, you will surely die. Now, we know they didn't physically die the moment they ate of it. There was a spiritual disconnect that happened between them and God. And when you are not connected to God, you are dead. It's just plain and simple. When we come to Christ, we are born again. You know, real life comes to us. But every person who's ever lived, except for maybe a couple of them that got translated or something they are born and they die death is the natural outcome of life and we get there by way of illness and disease and accident and old age and and it happens i'm not trying to be morose this is just the truth so 
the predicted course of things from God and the natural course of things from our own experience is that we will die. And if we are born and we get sick and we don't die, something changed the natural course. So God, through a great variety of ways, brings healing to us. So much so that I will say to you, uncategorically, with no reservation, God's typical response to your sickness is His healing. That is His typical response. Because over the course of your life, you will be sick a bazillion times. Well, you know, ministerially speaking. You'll have colds, and you'll have fevers, and you'll have rashes, and you'll have bad diseases, and you'll have cancers, and you'll have, and you'll have them almost yearly. I can predict almost down to the calendar day when in October I'm going to get a sinus infection. It just happens, I know. And sometimes they're worse, and sometimes it's COVID, and sometimes it's something, and sometimes it's something else. We all get sick. And almost every time you get sick, you get well. Well, how does that happen? Well, I just have an immune system. Well, who do you think gave you an immune system? Who designed you that way? So I got sick and my immune system kicked in. It's not an automatic thing. It's the divine design of God. And so you got sick and you took an antibiotic and so you got well. So I can say, well, I don't need your help this time, God, because these antibiotics took care of it. I don't think I would try that. <laughs> Does God give us antibiotics? Well, they don't come like in pill form from heaven. But I do believe that God has, in the era in which you and I live, the advances in medicine are just astounding. Sometimes they may go in some ways that maybe they shouldn't go, but the brain, the mind, the, the desire that God has placed within us to find ways to end suffering. This is a godly thing. It is my conviction that when you go to the hospital and they do something to you and you get well from it, that yes, there was this kind of medicine stuff, but you got well because God made it happen. What do you think Hezekiah thought? Well, God, I really don't need you this time because I've got the figs. He said, yeah, put those figs right here and thank you, God. So do I take an antibiotic? Yeah, I think so. And do I have a surgical procedure? Yes, I think so. And when I get finished, do I say thank you to the doctor? Yes. And by the way, make a payment on his Ferrari while you're at it. But nevertheless, recognize always, as believers especially, recognize always that the healing that comes into my life is God's gift. And He uses a great variety of ways to do it, but His typical response to my illness is his healing and he will do it in lots of ways sometimes through your immune system and sometimes through vaccines and sometimes through medications and sometimes through medical procedures and sometimes through other means and on occasion we can't put our finger on any one of those things and yet healing came and we say well God just took a step that changed it for the most part for the most part, like other miracles that we have seen, the healing miracle is not the eradication so much of the disease, but of the collapsing of time. And here's what I mean by that. Um, I said to you a long, long time ago when we looked at Jesus turning the water into wine, some of you were around when we did that, here's a miracle that there was water and he made into wine. Jesus just never was a Baptist. He was always a Methodist or he was something because it was real wine. But we've been working on him ever since then to be a Baptist. And so we're getting closer all the time. So he took water and poured, they poured it into a jar, a large jar. And when they drew it out, it was the best wine that they had served at the whole wedding. So water went in, wine came out. 
Well, if you have a grapevine in your yard and it's growing and it rains and the grapevine sucks up water and it produces grapes and you've got all these gorgeous grapes and you take those grapes and you put them in a vat and take your shoes off and you walk around on in a while, I know, I saw Lucy and I love Lucy do that, so I know that's how it's done. And you squish all the juice out and then you collect that and you sit it there for some while. After a bit, I don't know what else you have to do to it, but then it starts bubbling and you can drink it. Now, I'm not, but you can, you can. So water becomes wine every day, every day of the world. It's just it usually takes a long time for that to happen. So when Jesus took water and made it wine, the miracle was not really that water can become wine, but that it happened in this amount of time. So if my conclusion is that all healing comes by the intervention of God, whether it's immunity or surgery or medicine or whatever, the, the miracle of somebody was sick and then they were well is not so much a miracle of the process. I mean, this is what God does typically. It's the miracle of the time. Usually it takes some while. For Hezekiah, it took three days. For Peter's mother-in-law, it took half a second. So the miracle was not that he makes people well. The miracle is that he did it in that short amount of time. Somehow or another, the timing of God broke into our world because he doesn't have timing. And so it was the intervention of God's world into this world in the timing factor. And that may not make sense. That's okay. Don't worry about it. Hang on to this truth. And that is, when we get sick, God's intervention, he makes us well just about every time. There will come a day that we will face when we will get sick and we won't get well here. Right? Not only is God's typical response to our illness that we get well, it is His eternal response. <laughs> so there will come a day when sickness will take our life from here, but when we're there, it won't, we won't be sick anymore because of his intervention. And so we can, we can believe and trust God and even know that when that final sickness may come, and it may not be easy, but we can, with all our hearts and all our minds, believe that his response to that illness will be healing as well. So here was Hezekiah. He knew he was going to die. And when the word of the Lord came to him that he would not die, but he would live another 15 years, the process that God used somehow was related to those figs, but it was God's intervention that brought him to health. And so eventually he will be well enough that he will go. But now here comes this next little part in the passage where he says, what will be the sign? What will be the sign that this is going to happen? Now God doesn't typically, I don't think, God doesn't typically um, deal with us quite in this way. Like, Lord, I, I've got, I've got um, rheumatism. <laughs> I could, I've got appendicitis, whatever. And somehow you just know God is, yes, you will be well. Well, give me a sign that will indicate that you are, in fact, going to make me well. I'm going to make you well. Is that enough sign for you? Well, Hezekiah says, what is the sign that you're going to give me? Is that a little weird? Well, now, wait just one second. Wait one second. Go to Isaiah chapter 7, would you, for just a minute? Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7. So, um, I'm looking at verse 10. Isaiah chapter... Oh. Yes, yes, it is 7. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 10. Here's the way verse 10 reads. Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying... Do you remember who Ahaz was? That was Hezekiah's father. Okay, so Hezekiah grew up either having seen this happen or heard about this happening. And his father wasn't a very good king... But nevertheless, this was Hezekiah's father. So the word to the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign 
for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. So the sign was going to be that God was going to preserve Jerusalem. It wouldn't fall um, to Assyria. And Ahaz, who wasn't a godly man, gets this word from God, from Yahweh, and Ahaz says, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. That's not pious. That's not piety. God said, ask for a sign. And he said, I won't do it. This is rebellion. Then he said, God said, Listen now, O house of David. Is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men that you will try the patience of God as well? No, I guess maybe that's the prophet that's talking to him. Therefore, the prophet says to him, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look at what the sign is. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey. At the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good, for before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. So the sign was that in a short period of time, these kings that Ahaz was afraid of would be, would be gone. But the sign became much bigger than the life of Ahaz. It became a promise of Jesus. A virgin will conceive and give birth, and that was Mary. So for whatever reason it was, God had offered a sign to Ahaz that Jerusalem would be safe, and Ahaz said, no, I will not ask for a sign, and it was an act of rebellion. And so here's his son, Hezekiah. So the asking for a sign is couched in his family's past where his father wouldn't ask for a sign. And so I believe this was not a, a, an evil thing on the part of Hezekiah to ask that God would give him a sign. It's sort of a playing out of his family history. My father would not, I will. Would you demonstrate? Would you show yourself to me in some way? And he's going to get a sign from heaven to earth. Because the sign had been, ask something as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven, I'll give you whatever. But he would ask for none. And so God is now going to give a sign that's as big as heaven and that shows up on earth as well. And it's an unusual sign. You've probably read this before and you know of it. So Hezekiah said to Isaiah, What will be the sign that the Lord will heal me and that I shall go up to the house of the Lord on the third day? So Isaiah sort of gives him a choice. He said, All right, well, should the shadow go one way on the steps or should it go the other way on the steps? And Hezekiah's response is, Well, just the very natural movement of the sun and the shadows is going to go that way, but if it reversed itself, now that would be quite a sign, wouldn't it? And so he asked for the reversal. Now, how did the sign happen? Did the earth stop in its rotation and move back the other way a little bit? Or did the sun somehow actually, in fact, we, we know that the earth goes around the sun. The sun doesn't go around the earth. And so did the sun move in space? And the answer to that is God could do this however God wanted to do it. If he wanted to back up the rotation of the earth, that's fine. If he wants to move the sun a little bit in space, well, that's fine too. I would just say this. God rarely, God rarely shows himself in miraculous ways that nobody can doubt. Now, here's what I mean by that. Now, here was Jesus doing all kinds of wonderful miracles. He was healing people. He was bringing people back from the dead. He was feeding thousands of people with only a little bit of food. And the religious leaders who, were, who knew the Scriptures and knew they should be looking for the Messiah to come and knew what the Bible said about what the Messiah would be like and what He would do. And here they're seeing the actions of Jesus. And we've talked about this verse before, but they're seeing the actions of Jesus and they say, tell us, isn't it true you're a Samaritan and, and you do these things because... The devil helps you do it. You know, they, they saw the miraculous stuff that Jesus did, but they didn't see God in it. 
what that says to me is that God works in miraculous ways, if we want to use that term. He works in miraculous ways all the time. All the time. It's not rare. I said to you a while ago, you get sick and you get well because of God's intervention. All the time He's healing you. <laughs> all the time He's acting around us. But the only way, almost the only way, people see the actions of God is when they look at it by faith. God always does His actions in such a way that people of faith see it and give praise to God. And people without faith see the same thing, but they find some other way to explain it. Oh, well, that happened because the doctor did a surgery on you. Well, he did do a surgery on me, but it was God that gave the healing. I don't see it that way. Well, I do. You see, we saw it by faith, and they didn't see it with faith. And so these stories in Scripture where things happen that are just unexplainable, people of faith saw it. They saw it. Whoa, look what God has done. And people without faith saw Jesus do those things and said he, he had a demon. He had a demon. They didn't see God in it at all. God rarely, I believe, you may see it somewhat different, but I, God rarely does an action in such a way that everybody has to say, Oh my goodness, that was God, wasn't it? They'll find some other way to explain it. Always. A resurrection. Here's a resurrection. What do they say about the resurrection of Jesus? Oh, well, he wasn't really dead. He fainted on the cross. They took his body down. They put him in the tomb. It was cool. He was revived. And then being the Superman that he was, he rolled that great big stone away, and he stepped out, and he had his cape on and flew off. So I, I don't know. They come up with all kinds of crazy stuff. There's always some other way to explain the miraculous intervention of God. And so, who knows how it was that did God change the rotation of the earth or move the sun? Or was there some other way that, that, it, could, that it happened in some sort of semi-natural thing? But the process in which it happened and the timing in which it happened, that those who knew that God was about to do something said, Oh my goodness, look at there, the shadow's backing up. It doesn't do that, does it? Was it... A, a wall and a cloud and the, I, I don't know as far as I'm concerned God turned the world the other way around or moved the sun in the sky that, that's great for me but it's almost like as though if, if God stopped the rotation of the earth and then backed it up just a little bit there would have been an awful lot of people on earth going wait a minute <laughs> how does this happen So how did God do it I don't know I don't know it was something that typically would not have happened. And everybody who heard the story and were looking in faith saw the shadow move the wrong direction and said, oh, look what God has done. Look what God has done. How did the shadow move? God did it. No doubt. God did it. What was, the what was the physics of it? I frankly don't know. But those who had eyes of faith had no doubt but what God did. So what we do in our life is that we go through our life with this sensitivity that God is constantly working. He is constantly working. And He's constantly working in my life and in my body. And I will use a poultice of figs if that's what the doctor tells me to do. But I will trust that God is working in that process to bring about healing. And I will see... I will see the hand of God in my life every day because it's there. It's not my imagination. It's there. That's what we get in Hezekiah's prayer. I can't wait to see you guys again on August the 1st. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that your hand is always in our lives. If I see it or acknowledge it or not, it is there. Thank you. Help me to live, Lord, somehow with the sense of your constant supernatural presence and love and guidance. And may I 
live in such a way that the people who live around me and around my family may not be able to see you, but they will see what you did in me, in us. And it's in the wonderful, wonderful name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Amen. Good night.